All right, guys, welcome back to our teaching in the book of Colossians. Now, the last time we were here, we were finishing up chapter two, which basically was the section of Paul's theology. Remember, we talked about this on the last video, how that it was a very common practice for Paul that when he wrote an epistle, he would divide the epistle up first into some form of theological teaching and then the remainder, usually the book would be like half and half, but the remainder would be practical teaching. And when you say practical teaching, usually that's in the idea of responding to whatever theology that Paul has taught. But for the most part, righteous living, the practicing of a righteous life. So we finished chapter two. And basically, we, we have the idea of what Paul was dealing with. We talked about these two particular terms uh, in introduction and throughout all of these teachings. Paul was dealing with the issue of confronting Gnosticism, these false heretical Jewish teachers who were coming to the Gentile Christians, trying to teach them of some form of higher knowledge in Christ Jesus or some type of higher knowledge as related to salvation and also having a false understanding of the person of Christ, that he is the glorious God of creation. And in him, you are complete in him. You have the fullness of knowledge. And also in bringing in these false Jewish teachers, uh, that the Gentile Christians, these Gentile Christians need to adhere to the law of Moses and by uh, practicing the law of Moses along with other Jewish traditions and superstitions, the worshiping of angels and the like, also that they would find completion in these things. So Paul has thoroughly dealt with the issue of Gnosticism and legalism, the practicing of the law, whereby these things would somehow make you more complete apart from or other than Christ. He has dealt with these issues and for the most part has now laid them aside. And the theology that Paul was bringing forth was Christ. And basically, we see Christology, the study of the person and work of Christ, how that Christ is both God and man. God, our creator, as well as God, our savior, the one who was manifested in human flesh, uh, crucified and resurrected from the dead. Faith in him alone. Christ is the completion and perfection for all Christians. And this is what basically the theology that he was dealing with in chapters one and two. Now, <clears throat> we move to chapter three and here we deal with the practical section. And so I think we're going to talk about verses one through 17 as it pertains to Christian living, even specifically so. And you'll see that how Paul is talking about how we should live with respect one to another in the Christian community. But there is an overall sense. Don't forget that part now. An overall sense of how Christians ought to live, period but especially with respect to uh, believers, one with another. Okay, enough of all of that. So let's just simply get into the practical section here. Responding to being in Christ. When you say responding to being Christ, that means how we live now that we have been saved, now that we are in Christ Jesus. Okay, getting into it. Verse number one, therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, Keep seeking the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on the earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. OK, so now he says, OK. Since you have been raised up with Christ Jesus, seek the things which are above. And by this very usage of this terminology, he is simply talking about how the life of the believer is transformed. The new way of the life of the believer in the sense, again, there is that uh, 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 symbolism 
to baptism that Paul is exploiting here. Notice in baptism, what you go down symbolizing death and also what you raise the person up out of the water symbolizing a newness of life. And this is what Christ experienced. Remember, Christ was baptized by John the Baptist, that he may relate with his people in all things, fulfill all righteousness. But this symbolizes that in Christ Jesus, as Jesus was resurrected from the dead unto new life, so is the believer resurrected in new life, resurrected from what? From the old manner of life into a new manner of life, that which pertains unto Christ. Notice, so to keep seeking the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. And now here too, we see an inference once again. If you've been following me in these teachings, especially in chapter one, where G, I'm sorry, where Paul was speaking about the exalted Christ, Christ, God, the creator, and also in his resurrection from the dead, what? In his finished work, and we're not going to touch Hebrews, but they kind of almost senses in a sense of Hebrew in the completed work of Christ, the true high priest of God, he sat down at the right hand of God as his work was finished. Hebrews, but we're not going to digress, not going to digress. But what? It speaks of that inference that Paul was giving in chapter one in talking about the exaltation of Jesus Christ. And we see that why he is seated at the right hand of God, an exalted position. So therefore, since we too have been raised with Christ again, that those positional truths, we talked about that, I think in the very last video, uh, uh, that which that which pertains to being in Christ, what is real for the believer in Christ? What is a benefit for the believer by being in Christ? Positional truth. So he says, what? Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. And so this is uh, dealing with the issue of being renewed that results in the conduct. And that's what he's going to talk about in the remainder of this particular section. Having a renewed mind, you are now a believer in Christ Jesus. You are dead, baptized, going down, dead to the old self, raised up from the water. And now you are new in Christ Jesus with a new mind, setting your mind on the things pertaining to life of righteousness, a righteousness from Christ Jesus. What? Set your mind on things, not the things on the earth, old life. For you have died. Again, notice that baptism symbolism. You have died, gone down into the water, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. You have died to your old self. You have died to your old manner of life. And that new life that you have is hidden with Christ in God. But hidden does not simply mean hidden for the, uh, uh, not to be lived out in the world. That's not what he's talking about when he says hidden, to be hidden from how you live in the world, but hidden from that revelatory glory that you will receive in the future. Notice verse number four, when Christ, who is our life, is revealed, that is, at the revelation of Jesus Christ, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. So notice what he says. Then the fullness of our life, true life for the believer, that glorified life, or in other words, when Paul speaks of it a number of times, the redemption of our body, the rapture of the believer, the rapture of the church. First Thessalonians 4, first uh, Corinthians chapter 15, that resurrection, that being changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. This life of the believer will be made manifest. The glory of who we truly are, which for the moment is hidden. We don't know what we shall be right now. That glory is hidden. Hid, and we don't know right now what we shall be, but we will, we will know what we will be 
when Christ himself is revealed. Why? For we shall be like him. So anyway, okay, enough of that. So the point is having a renewed mind, having a mind since we are now in Christ Jesus, a mind that has a reflection, that renewedness in behavior. And even though you hear me saying behavior in a premature sense, but this is what Paul is talking about as he moves through the rest of the text. You cannot have new mind. Un I'm sorry. You cannot have new behavior until first you have a new mind. So first you must die. Baptism going down into the water, death to the self, death to your former way of life. And then you must have newness of mind being raised up from the water of baptism, symbolizing new life, new mind, which will result in, since you are a new creature, a new creation, new behaviors, behaviors that are different than your former behavior. And this is what Paul is going to talk about for the remainder of this section. All right, five. So now watch it. Therefore, since this is the case, consider the members of your earthly body as dead. See that baptism thing? Dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. For, be for it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. And in them, you also once walked when you were living in them. Okay, so now what does he say? Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body. That is literally our physical bodies. And the idea here is he's dealing with the issues of sinfulness, the fleshly nature that remains in the body, even though we have been born again, even though we are positionally in Christ. Nevertheless, there is sin that dwells in our flesh. Again, Romans chapter seven that we talked about in other videos in this particular teaching in Colossians. But notice he says we, we have we have here consider and that word for consider uh, uh, con no, actually Consider the idea, consider as dead. That's the idea here, but that is not. And I mean, that is not a good translation to consider as dead. The word actually is necrosate, necrosate. That is put to death. And that word is in what, and I don't want to uh, uh, get too deep in the Greek, but it's good to see it here. It is in the aorist imperative. Aris is the sense. It's like a sense of past tense. Imperative means a command, but because he gives it and the idea, even though he, the word grammatically is in the aorist tense, like in the past, and it's an imperative a command, but the, the, the usage of the word is in a present tense. That's why they say, uh, consider in the present tense, to do this now. But the point that I'm trying to make is Paul is not saying consider something. Paul is given the command put to death. And because it is in the aorist imperative, he is giving a sense of once for all do this, do this. So it is a very strong command that Paul is using. And what is that command that Paul is using that reflects a newness of life. What is that command that does what? Reflects newness of life. Put to death what? Immorality. And the word here is porneia. It is the general word that is used for all manners of sexual sins. Uh, fornication, adultery, uh, uh, gay, lesbian, all this stuff that we see, transgender, all of these types of sexual sins. He says, put it to death along with impurity. This also deals with sexual sins and it kind of broadens it out. Then he talks about passion, pathos, which deals with the lust, 
all of these things dwell and, and, and I don't want to get so much into uh, defining each one of them individual, but all of these things dwell in our flesh. That's why he says earthly body, these sinful inclinations, even though we have been transformed by the power of the spirit of God, nevertheless, these sinful desires still remain in the flesh and it is a constant war. We have to be at constant war with our flesh. And so Paul is saying to engage in this by battling this, your own flesh, putting it to death, passion, evil desire, desires that are not in accordance with the scripture, with the righteousness of God, with holiness that pertains to goodness and truth and things of this nature, evil desire. And then he says, greed, which amounts to idolatry. So he says to, and the greed that amounts to idolatry. And, and I always thought that to be something interesting. Greed, the desire for things, the desire for wealth, the discontentment with one's lot in life, the discontentment with the journey that God has given you to take, the discontentment with the things that God has given you, all of it so wonderfully reflects back to Israel's journey in the wilderness, in the book of Exodus, in the book of Numbers, discontentment. We see what? They're mummering and complaining. But anyway, and I don't want to preach that. I love to preach that stuff. And, and I preach it so much to even to myself, not only to those who hear me, but I preach that to myself to remember, to be content that wherever you are in life, if you have not done something to, to bring about God's discipline and chastisement in your life, it's where God wants you to be. And even if you have done something that brings about God discipline, it is still what? Where God wants you to be. Therefore, what? In everything, give thanks. Why? For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Okay, okay. Enough of that. I've been preaching on that. But the greed that amounts to idolatry, the evil desiring of accumulation and, and other things apart from what God has given you, it becomes idolatry. Why? Because you are basically worshiping other things. You are worshiping self when you are seeking to satisfy yourself or satisfy other things rather than God. Thus, it is idolatry. So he just simply says, okay, just a point, point, that put to death, put to death these desires of the flesh. And then he says in verse number six, for it is because of these things that the wrath of God, I got another problem with the translation, will come upon the sons of disobedience. Now, when you say will come by the translation, they are looking for, forward into the future to a time of ultimate judgment. But that is not the word in the Greek. The word is di a, I'm sorry, di ha erkatai he orge tu theu. That is because of these things comes, comes and erkatai, which were they, were they translating here, will come, is a present active indicative. And we, we never want to try to confuse you with this type of grammar, the grammar of Greek, but you need to understand it because it helps you to understand what Paul is saying here. Paul is not saying the wrath of God will come. Paul is saying the wrath of God is already present. And he uses this same type of terminology in the book of Romans that the wrath of God comes. That's what he's saying. Comes upon the sons of disobedience. That is, there is already a present tense. There is already a right now wrath of God that the unbelievers, that the sons of disobedience are already experiencing right now. And there will be even a further or final wrath of God that they will receive 
in the day of judgment. But nevertheless, the point here is the wrath of God is already being experienced for unbelievers. So thus he is saying what? He is saying to God's people, do not do these things whereby God chest, God judges, God judges his wrath is coming upon unbelievers. But let me say this as it is in my mind, believers, believers of God, people who are saved never. And, and, and like the rock used to say, and I mean, never experience the wrath of God. We don't experience God's wrath. We experience the chastisement and the discipline of God. Hebrews chapter 12, God disciplines all of his sons. So even though there is a, a, a sense of similarity, unbelievers experience the wrath of God. Believers experience the chastening hand of God, the discipline of God, that they might be corrected. Again, Hebrews chapter 12. Okay. So, but the overall point here is simply saying here is this, that we need to put to death certain sinful inclinations because what? It kind of brings us to groups us with those upon whom the wrath of God come. We won't experience the wrath. We'll experience discipline, the chastening hand of God to bring us to repentance, to get us to walk in a way that is pleasing to God, but nevertheless avoid these things so that we ourselves may avoid chastening. And he says in verse number seven, in remembrance, like that baptism dead thing on the water, what former way of life, there was a time when we actually walked. That is, we lived this way. Okay. We lived this way and we did these things. So verse number eight, Paul continues to command the believer how to walk in this newness, in his new way of life. But now you also put them all aside. What? Anger, wrath, malice, slander, abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you have laid aside the old self with its evil practices and have put on the new self who is being renewed to, to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him, a renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, and free man, but Christ is all and in all. So he continues to uh, give commands to admonish the believers how to live. And these are for the most part, negative commands. Don't do these things. What? Put them aside. And, and the idea of Put them aside. That's verse number eight. I want to make sure that my Greek is correct. Uh-huh. Apatheste. Apatheste. And, and apatitemi. So, but the idea is like dirty clothes on your body to take them off. You know, nobody wants to have dirty clothes. And notice the fullness of that idea. You, you've been raised up with Christ in newness. You got a new, clean body new way of life, how unseemly it is to have dirty, nasty clothes on a new washed and clean body. So quite naturally, what? Take those nasty, dirty clothes off. And what are these dirty clothes? These are these particular characteristics that Paul is talking about. What? What? Take off. Take off. Anger being angry, having this, uh, 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 this, this anger that kind of like resides underneath the level and bubbling underneath the surface anger and anger that can explode even into what wrath. And that is that outburst. <laughs> you just get what, what happened? Uh, John just got hot and start throwing the chairs. <laughs> wrath and malice 
that malice is dealing with the intent, the ill intent. And, and, and I love that. And I really love that idea and that word of malice. You can do something, but it is the reason for why you did it. Did you do it for the right reason? Did you, did you do it for the right result? Did you do it that people might be benefited? You can chastise an individual and you, you can bring harsh words to an individual, but what is the purpose of the harsh chastisement? Is it to bring about repentance so that the individual would do better to do right as a Christian to walk in a way that pleases Christ? Malice. What is your intention in when you are doing things? But anyway, anger, wrath, malice, and slander. Slander speaks for itself. To speak negative of a person, to, 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 to bring about a negative concept, a negative thinking concerning the person. Slander and abusive speech from your mouth. Harsh words, even what can be also categorized is profanity. You know, it's not good for Christians to speak in a certain way, to use certain words. And all of these things, notice all of these things lie within the negative. Once again, what? Anger, wrath, malice, slander, abusive speech from your mouth. He continues on. Do not lie to one another. And again, and I like to remember, again, notice lying is forbidding for Christians. But notice again, I want to bring your attention here to one another. And that's why we see in this particular section, even though Paul is giving commands about certain things to do and not to do here, especially thus as we've been going so far, what? to these negative commandments, things not to do. But you can see that Paul's words here is to the Christian body more so as a whole to the Christian body with respect to yourselves, with respect. Let me just simply say it this way, with respect to the church. And what I mean is this, these things should characterize our life wherever we go in the world or in the church. But especially you can see the language here being guarded towards what church members itself. Notice uh, again, do not lie to one another, other saints of God, but don't lie to nobody. But other saints of God continuing since you have laid aside the old self with this evil practices again, coming back from the beginning uh Baptism dead, raised from back, raised up from that water, go down, dead, raised up from the water, new a life, new life, old self going down, raised up, new self. You have this what? New self. So therefore you laid aside the old self, uh, uh, your former life, but you now have this new self. So therefore you lay aside what? Old evil practices, because in the past, in our former lives, we did all of these things, the anger, the wrath, the malice, the slander, the abusive speech, the immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, greed. We did all of these things in our former life. But he says again, what? A patistic. Take it off like dirty clothes. These are evil practices of your former life. Thus put them away. Now, Paul is going to, uh, I'm sorry, before we get into that, we got to finish this section. Uh, putting on the new self, notice we are new creatures in Christ Jesus, renewed to a true knowledge. I believe that word again is epignosis. Yes, it is. Epignosine. That is the true knowledge. A true knowledge of Christ Jesus is always reflected in the person's life. A true knowledge is not a knowledge simply in your head. It is not a knowledge about how much Bible you know, how, how intelligent you are, even in things of scripture. True knowledge of Christ Jesus is reflected ultimately in how you live, how you live. Because notice the very context of what we've been talking about 
is your manner of life. But anyway, so renewed to a true knowledge, according to the image of the one who created him. Let's talk about that person who has been renewed, this new creature where there is no distinction between Greek and Jew. And here, before I even get into uh, uh, dealing with all of these distinctions, staying with the full context of Colossians, okay? Remember what was going on. You had these heretical Jewish teachers coming in, trying to tell the Gentiles, adopt the law of Moses, adopt certain Jewish traditions and superstitions because because you don't become and become circumcised and because you don't do these things, you are not like us. You are incomplete and you not like us. And notice Paul is once again throwing cold water on this particular idea. Paul is saying when you come to Christ Jesus, there remains no further distinctions. We are all the same in Christ Jesus. We are all one in Christ Jesus. There is no, now let's get to these particular distinctions. There is no Greek and Jew, and this is the distinction of race. This is de dealing with the, okay, I almost want to hoop and preach on this part, but consider this is 2024 when I'm making this video. Consider all of the poison that we have in the American society today. All of the divisions that people are trying to make because of race. I'm this and I'm that. And this crap has permeated the church. It has found its way into the Christian community to bring about division, whether on white or black, especially with that type of foolishness. But enough preaching there. The bottom line, what is the scripture saying? There is no distinction in race, Greek and Jew. Then what? Circumcised and uncircumcised. And you can see how that hit, that hits directly with these false Jewish teachers, these Judaizers telling them, these Gentile Christians, you need to become circumcised. You need to be like us. Join our party. Paul is saying, no, being in Christ, no distinction whether you are cut in your flesh or not. Barbarian, and this is the idea of uh, those who are considered to be uncultured, uncultured. You are not sophisticated. And then, rarely you see Paul use this type of division here. Scythian. Scythian means that it's like the wild folk out there. <laughs> You just come, you're not just simply uncultured and unlearned, but you are wild, the nomadic people out there. You, 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 you just out there. That's that idea there. Scythian. And then he says, slave, that makes no difference if you are a slave or if you are free. So Paul uh, uh, really goes into whatever the distinctions might be. What Greek and Jew race, circumcised, uncircumcised, religious, uh, 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 to do with circumcised you know, under the law of Moses or uh, barbarian. You, you're uncultured. You're not sophisticated. Scythian, you wild and out there slave or a free man. There is no difference. Why? Because Christ is all and in all. Christ is our everything and all are one in Christ Jesus. Okay. So now, uh, as he dealt with those negative commandments, he's now in these further point of this, in this section, going to give positive commandments. We knew all the negative commandments. We've already dealt with all of those. Positive commandments, things that Paul commands, the word of God, that you should do. Remember, at first he said, take off like dirty clothes. Now that you are take, you have taken off the dirty clothes, we don't want to be naked. You want to put on clothes, put on some clean clothes. And these will be clothes of righteousness. But let's continue on in verse number 12. So I like 12. As those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, 
kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with, notice the language, one another, forgiving each other body of Christ. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Wow. Wow. I am on the floor. Let's talk about it. Verse number 12. I love it. I love it all. Verse number 12. So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion. Okay. Let's look at this in the Greek because in the Greek, there is somewhat word order in the Greek is important. It, sometimes it's not ultimate, ultimate important, but it is important, very important because by word order, we can see emphasis, emphasis being placed. Okay. So he starts off in do stay. You put on, and that word in the aorist imperative, just like the previous word was aorist imperative. That is, Paul is using a definite command. Like he said, put to death, do it once and for all. Again, do this once and for all. The strength of that word, put on. Put on. Un, un, therefore, hos eklektoi tu theu hagioi ka egape menoi. Okay. As elect ones of God, what? Holy and beloved. Now, the idea, idea of that, this is our, this is a positional truth. This is what we are in Christ Jesus. It's so This is such a, a, a deep statement. Okay, positional truth. What we have, what we are in Christ Jesus by the will of God. What do we have? We have election, election, eclectoi to theu, elect of God. You are not who you are because of your own decision. You are not who you are because of your own choice. You are not, in other words, you are not saved. One day, it was on a Tuesday, I, I, I got tired of living in my sin and I decided to give it up. Yeah, I understand all of that. But the idea of eclectoi, which comes from the very foundational word, elect. Elect means to be chosen. Chosen means, this is not, chosen means you are the object of something that is done by someone else. What is being done by someone else? A choosing. Who is the someone else that is doing the choosing? God. Thus, our election comes, is of God. See, that be that's a beautiful theology. You ain't saving yourself. And I'm not talking about dying on the cross. Uh -uh. It's, it ain't you. God, from the foundation of the world, has chosen you. You see it now? Okay, what? What, what is that position that God, that truth? Where has God placed us? Listen, to the hagioi, that is uh, uh, holy. The idea of this means to be sanctified, to be set apart, and then what? Beloved. Thus, what is it saying? That God has chosen, God has elected us to be what? Set aside and to be beloved of him. So all of these things are done graciously, by God. Okay, I'm going to leave that alone because you can just really work with that because number one, the scripture does not give an Armenian persuasion. Salvation is not done by the person being saved. It is not an act of the individual. It is not, it is only received by the individual. Salvation is 100% the work of God. Okay, enough of that because you get into a great digression. So what? 
put on because what God has sovereignly chosen to us to be holy and God has sovereignly chosen us as his beloved people. Therefore, we need to do what? Put on. Now, let's continue. Put on what? A heart of compassion that speaks for itself without me even getting into it. A compassionate heart. What? Kindness speaks for itself. Humility, it speaks for itself. Not to think so much about yourself. Not to think above yourself than you ought to. Gentleness, how we deal with one another. Patience, forbearing with one another. Number one, you got to recognize what? Sin and your own shortcoming. And thus you are. And so when you deal with what? The sin and shortcoming of other people, you can be patient. Why? Because you know you got them too. Patient, thus doing what? Verse number 13, bearing with one another. And it brings in the idea of being long suffering, long suffering in putting up with what? The shortcomings of your brothers and sisters. And notice again the language. One another. He's speaking to what? The body of Christ. So this section, once again, this is what I keep talking about, is dealing with Paul's commandments to the Christian body, especially as it has to do with Christians. He wants you to have these characteristics overall whether dealing with saved people or not saved people, but especially the language when he, when he keeps talking about the one another, this really uh, uh, deals with Christians. And you can see him talking about what, especially towards one another, other believers. So, so watch this, especially towards our brothers and sisters. What? Have a heart of compassion. Be ever so kind to your brothers and sisters. Be humble with your brothers and sisters. Be gentle when you deal with your brothers and sisters. Be patient when you deal with your brothers and sisters. Bear with, I, I know they may not have your level of spiritual maturity and understanding in certain things, So, but so bear with them. You see it now? Bearing with one another. Continuing, forgiving what? each other. Forgive your brothers and sisters because we're going to sin against one another. We're going to do things that we ought not to do. We are imperfect people. You are imperfect. So understand they are imperfect too. You do wrong. They do wrong. So always have the spirit that is willing to forgive one another. And now notice this section. And here is where I want to lay on the ground. Just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you watch. Let me do some Greek. I just want to do some Greek. Kathos kachakurias. Even as. So it brings in that sense of, in the sense of comparison. You do something. Even as. Hakurias. Even as the Lord. What? Ekarisata. That is. Even as the Lord. Ekarisata. Humin. Even as the Lord so graciously, so gracious. See, that's why you want to lay on the ground. When Jesus forgave us our sins, he didn't say, well, now I'm going to forgive you because you did that. No, the very nature of that word graciously, he forgave us. There was no reason he didn't have to. We didn't deserve it. So, but nevertheless, even though we were so awful and didn't deserve it, didn't he still forgive us for our sin? He was so gracious. He was so good to forgive our awful behinds. And this is that language. Uh, 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 do I want to continue? In this way, hutos ka humes. Hutos means in this way, that is in the same gracious way that Jesus forgave us our sins and he continues to forgive us of our sins. What? You be the same with your brother. Now that, the reason why I like that so much is it's on the realm of impossibility. 
who can forgive like Jesus? That perfection. So the point he's trying to say is, have your heart set in such a way that it is always willing and ready to forgive your imperfect brothers and sisters. And may I say, because you too are imperfect and will have need of forgiveness yourself. But the point is, you can see how all of these things are tying to the body of Christ. Uh, thus, we do verse number 14, because I was just about to get into it. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Let the so let me stop there. So notice, and it's such a beautiful thing. Notice. So what? Beyond all of these things, another thing to put on, what? Love. To have that agape. Beautiful word. Not philo. Philo is the, like the phileo. The love of a friend. That's not what he said. He said to agapeo. That love that God has for us, that love that Jesus has for us. It is a love. And I, okay, let's just talk. It is a self sacrificing love. It is a, you will give up your life. Love you that much. It is a love that loves the object of that love, whereby the object is unworthy of the love. That, that is the beauty of that word, that which you are loving, which is the other saint of God, one another. Love them to the degree that you would give up your physical, mortal life for your brother and sister. Yes, love them. They who are even unworthy of your love, they fall so short. They are full of so many faults, but still, nevertheless, you will love them. So you see that? See that beauty of that word? So thus, greater than anything else, have this love for one another, which is, notice, the perfect and complete bond. And actually, that, that's basically how it ends. That perfect and complete bond, the word is, sundesmos, that bond, that which binds together, that binds you together. And that's why they say it, or they translate it, bond of unity. What binds the body of Jesus Christ perfectly? What uh, 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 hermetically seals all of these things together, loving one another. So not only what, having what, putting on heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, not only what, bearing with one another, forgiving one another. If anybody got any kind of complaint, did I skip that? Did I skip that? So let me just preach it right quick. Whoever has a complaint, don't, don't come. Well, he did this. She said this. And, and you know, I got a problem with forgiving. I got a problem because they did. Whoever has any complaint, I don't care what your complaint is. I don't care what they did to you. I don't care what they said to you. Grow up. Love enough, be compassionate enough, be kind enough, be merciful enough, be humble enough, be forbearing one another enough that no matter what the complaint is, forgive now going on, bearing with one another, forgiving one another. And you do it just like the Lord does. Did, does is the right, right verb too because it deals with what? Uh, a present tense, like the Lord forgives us. And in all things, put on love because love will do what? Lock us together. Love binds us together. All right. Now, 15. Let's try to bring this to a close. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. I like it. I like it. Rule in your hearts to the which indeed you were called in one body. See that unity again? And be thankful. Let's continue. Let the word of Christ 
richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thanks, thankfulness in your hearts to God. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. All right, I like that. So he says what? In his final admonition here, he's bringing these things down. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. Now, what does that mean? It is from that operative word. We got to go to the Greek. Don't get upset. Let the peace of God. I'm not going to take in a lot of Greek, but I just deal with one particular word. How about that? Let the peace of Christ, let the peace of Christ rule. Now, that's how they translate. So we're going to look at that particular word. And that word is brabueto, brabueto. Let it rule. What it means is, let it, brabueto means let it be the judge. Let it be the judge. So, see why it's so beautiful? What, what do you mean? Let what be the judge? Peace of Christ. Let the peace of Christ be the judge that we were called in one body. Oh my, I like it. Okay, let me just stop liking it and explain it. The peace of Christ. This is what we were called unto. We were called, see, unity, when there is unity, unity comes because there is peace. If you got arguing, dissension, devouring one another, maliciousness one another, mistreating one another, talking bad about one another, being unforgiving of one another, guess what you don't have? There is no peace in the congregation. There is no peace in the body of Christ. Thus, you will not have unity. The only way you can have unity be as one, the determination for God, for his people, you got to have peace. But how can you have peace? Listen, let the peace of Christ rule. Let it be the determining factor. So in other words, what is Paul saying? What makes for peace? Whatever is going on in the church, try to have peace. You're going to always, and I, and I had to scream it, I scream it loud, always you're going to always do what the Bible says to do. You're going to always follow every. And when I say every, I'm gonna, let's be bringing the rock again. And I mean every. You're going to follow every single command in the scriptures for the body of believers. You're going to always do that. But you're going to do these things with a heart compassion with a mindset that says we want our church to have peace. We want the members in the church to have peace with one another. So you do these things abiding and keeping the commandments of Christ with a mindset looking to what brings about peace in the body of Christ. If this for example, so you guys understand it. I hope I'm not going too long and, and, and treating you like children, but I want you to understand it. If a particular thing in the church, number one, as long as it's what the word said, you do what the word say. But if a particular thing in the church is bringing about division and bringing about problems, then disregard, disregard that. Why? It's bringing about confusion and disorder. You want to do things that are what? Bra bueto. Judge things that bring about peace. Does it bring peace in the body or does it bring division in the body? And Lord have mercy. I can do so many different things. A lot of things come to my mind when I uh, just now, you know. OK, fine. Guys, bear with me. As a, a pastor, I've been in the church a long time, been saved. Long time. God saved me. And I've seen so many different things. I've seen the church try to raise 
I've seen the church try to raise money for different functions and things of that nature. And they do all kind of little gimmicks. <laughs> They're not found in the scripture. Just, just, just do what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. But they do all kind of little gimmicks to raise money. So we got the, the gold group, we got the silver group, and we got the bronze group. And so the gold group will give X number of dollars. That's going to be the uh, maximum number. The gold asks for a thousand dollars. They give a thousand and up. And then the silver group may give 500 and something like that. And then the bronze group may give a hundred dollars. Cause you know, if you really in the bronze group, you know, you, you really not the, you the poor folk and you like the nobodies and the silver, you kind of like the kind of somebody and the gold group, you kind of like the big time folk and you know you get the high recognition but really it all brings about division and it brings about malice feelings in the church and then you got some people acting in pompous pride and Jesus said don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing when you give don't sound a trumpet but all of these such stuff like that that brings a sense of it's just not good for the body it's not bringing about peace Brabueto. So what? Let the peace of Christ, let the end result, whatever you're doing in the church, let the goal be to bring about peace because God has determined for us to be unified and in all of our doings in these things, what? Be thankful. Okay, now enough of that. Let's continue because we got to bring it to a close. So he says, let the word of Christ richly dwell in you. Now we have to look at that again. Halagos, the word to Christu, the word of Christ that is used in a genitive. And you have to understand, I don't want to tear you up with the Greek genitive, with the Greek grammar again. I'll explain it. But to Christu, the genitive uh, dwell in you, plusios, uh, uh, dwell richly in you. Let the word of Christ or let the word concerning Christ. And in this, by this, you can see Paul's reflecting back on what he was talking about in the first two chapters. What? The whole point of chapters one and two in thematic form, Jesus, you are complete in Jesus. In Jesus, there is the fullness of all things. In Jesus, there is the fullness of divinity. There is the fullness of what it means to be God. Thus, in Jesus, you are complete. So you can see again that reflection back to the first chapter, first two chapters, that theological section. So let the word, the teachings, see what I'm talking about now? Those things that you have been taught concerning Jesus. Let these things dwell richly in you in all kinds of ways. Let God, the word, the teaching concerning Jesus be in you taught in all kinds of ways. Then that's what the rest of the section mean. What? In wisdom, in wisdom, in all wisdom, in what? Teaching, in teaching, doing what? Admonishing one another. So you are being able, you are teaching one another, instructing one another, encouraging one another, even in what? In the Psalms. And the Psalms are basically, these are the Psalms itself from the book, from the, uh, uh, we call it the book of Psalms, the 150 numbers of Psalm. Basically it is, these were set to hymnals, the singing. That's why they're called Psalm. Okay. In Psalms, and also in other forms of hymns and even in other spiritual songs. That is uh, non-worldly singing. Don't bring the world into the church in this singing. Uh, but spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your heart. So in all your manner of worshiping and notice teaching is a form of worshiping, singing, and praising God, all of these things concerning Christ, right? And in finality, in finality, so let me finish it. So singing, teaching, being thankful in all of these things to God. What? Whatever you do in word or in deed, in all manner of your life, 
things that come forth from your mouth, deed, how you live in word or deed, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus. It is all with respect. It is all with regards to the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God, giving thanks through him to God the Father. And I don't think that through him should be looked at lightly because what? Again, remember chapters one and two. Yo, uh, uh, the Judaizers, the heretical teachers, you need to do this. You need to do that so you can be complete and you need to do the worshiping of the angels. And you do no, 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 no. Paul was saying what it is all about Jesus. It is all about Jesus. Thus, how you live, how you worship, you do it all with respect through whom the Lord Jesus, he is your Everything. Don't get uh, a sidetracked by nothing else. Jesus is your all in all. Jesus is your reason for why you do what you do and you do it all to the glory of God, the father, being thankful to God, the father in how you live. OK, so now we're going to stop there. It's gone long enough. As Paul has talked about in this particular section here and notice once again, and I did bring it out along the way how you can see clearly how this section pertained, pertains <laughs> to the body of Christ, especially that language, one another, how we need to live with one another, how we need to act towards one another, being patient, being kind, being loving, being humble, and all of these things, right? And also too, generically, how Paul was saying, we have died to the old self, we're now new. We are alive in Christ Jesus. Since you have a new life, since you are a new man, take off your old dirty clothes. And these were the sinful practices that we once did before we were converted. Put on the new man. These are new things. These are acts of righteousness, new character, new conduct, or should I say holy conduct. And live in this manner now since we have been, uh, we are the elect chosen of God to be and beloved of God, holy ones of God. Since we have been set apart for this, live this way. Okay. And in all things, what? In the body of Christ, look for what makes peace in your church and be thankful and do what? Teach, sing, praise God, all of these things, what the word of Christ richly dwell in you and be thankful to God through Jesus. Okay. All right. Enough of that. Thank you guys for joining me for today's practical teaching. Join me next time as we continue in this chapter, even to the remainder of the book in the practical sections, Paul is simply saying how God's people ought to live. All right, in the continuing videos. Now, if this video has been a blessing uh, for you, there is a link uh, in the description that you can use to support the ministry. And I'm asking you for your support. And I also wanna thank those who do support this ministry. And also, uh, if you have not subscribed to the channel by now, Consider subscribing to the channel, and if you enjoyed this video, hit the like button. All right? All right, guys. God bless you. Thank you for joining me. Look to see you next time.